with you all things are possible.
Today is the last in our series on Solomon's wisdom, and you can start off by opening up to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17. We've got a picture here, if you'd put that up, Andrew, and um, yeah, this is one of my faves. It got kind of squished, oh well, or kind of stretched, maybe you can get it. I deal in a lot of memes online. You wouldn't know that unless you're in some of my Facebook groups that I help. There are actually some groups I help to lead. And memes are the modern, um, modern form of uh, written communication that most speaks to us, to the young generation, like YWAM's trying to reach. So if you're old and you don't really get it, it's time to get it. It's time to learn to speak meme. That's how, the, that's how we influence the world. Then, of course, there's the Holy Spirit we're counting on as well. Praise God. All right. So today um, we're talking about loving God's plan, and we're going to be um, looking at the end of Solomon's life and, um, and seeing where he went wrong and where we can go right. And to summarize, where Solomon went wrong is he stopped loving God's ideas and started... in grabbing a hold of some other kinds of wisdom. The fear of the Lord that we're going to talk about today, I'm just going to give you a simple definition, is fear of the Lord is really believing God. If you want to write that down, I didn't give you blanks today, but I put your scriptures there. I hope you have a Bible with you. I'm going to be turning through my Bible and reading, but in case you didn't, uh, you got a hand out there today. It, the fear of the Lord involves, it's basically really believing God, believing what God has said, that God is true and real, and the things he said are true, the things he said are coming, are coming. What he said about himself is the reality of our lives, our situation, and uh, part of that is believing what God says about our life and the joy that can be ours as we follow him, following God. So let's jump right in here. I'm going to be moving pretty quickly um, through this because we've got some good scriptures to get into here. Let's talk about, first off, what Solomon knew from Proverbs chapter 9, 10 through 12. I'm just going to read it off my handout here. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for your own benefit, and if you mock you alone will bear the consequences. We had a great message on the fear of the Lord in this series. But um, it's important to see here that we're talking about, uh, for today's message, really believing God, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What, the, what he's talking about there, in essence, is really believing what God has said. So I look at it this way. Let's say you've got a job, and uh, you're thinking about just goofing off and no-showing your job today because you feel like learning about memes or whatever it is. And uh, so there are, there are two things going on if you're a Christian or someone who knows what God has said. Number one, there's, there's the shouldn'ts. You know you shouldn't just skip out on your job because you might get fired. You know you shouldn't do a poor job at your work because God said you should do it as unto him because it's the responsible thing to do because it's a good example and you don't want to be a poor example because your reputation, uh, you know, at your workplace and maybe at the next job that you have to get because you get fired from there is going to be tainted. So there are lots of reasons you should show up at work. The fear of the Lord goes beyond that. It goes beyond that to the place where I really believe what God has said 
about me being honorable and fulfilling my responsibilities. And so I, be, I, be, I come to realize that not showing my job more than just doing something wrong is stupid. It's stupid. It's stupid because God knows best. And God's way of living, his instruction in our lives is really the smartest way to live, the best way to live. And I believe what God has said about doing things with all my heart, about loving the people around me, and uh, to live any other way, um, to put it simply as they would put it at Oxford, is stupid. See, when I really believe that, a whole new dynamic begins to work in my life. Uh, I begin to look at God's commands not as just things I should do because God's looking at me, but things I want to do because I don't like to do stupid things on purpose. I do enough stupid things on accident, okay? There's enough, like, I'm still learning. Just this week, I learned some, I was like, God, wow, you are a geek, Dallas. You're a goofball. You, I, I learned some things about social interactions this week. I was like, yeah, you do do that. Oh, my goodness. And I'm like old as the hills. I'm, I'm, I'm like, someday I might be as old as my dad even. I'm old and still learning these things, so, you know, trying to love well and not be stupid. So I, I've learned that God's commands, they're a joy for me to, to walk in. They really are a joy because I want to do things that are going to actually bring blessing in my life, blessing my stand before God someday. But I want to do the things that are actually going to produce good fruit for the people around me, for the things that I think God's asked me to do, and of course, for eternity, most important of all. Fearing the Lord means really believing what God has said. So this is what Solomon knew. He wrote all about it. And now let's take a look at what Solomon did. Let's start with Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is the instruction Solomon knew all about. It was written long before Solomon's day. I'm going to begin in verse 14 of chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. This is the instructions for the appointment of a king. When you enter the land that the Lord your God has given you, take possession of it, live in it, and say, when you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me, you are to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. That was Solomon. Appoint a king from your brothers, and there was a local. You are not to set a foreigner over you or one who is not of your people. All right, Solomon qualified for that. Verse 16, however, and if you're taking notes in your Bible or on your handout, there are four things we're going to point out here. Number one, he must not acquire many horses for himself or send the people back to Egypt to acquire many horses. That means lots of horses. For the Lord has told you, you are never to go back that way again. So number one, the king is not to acquire many horses and go back to Egypt to get them. God says one of the reasons is you're not to go back that way. You're separated from Egypt now for good. In this day, if you were going to be a superpower uh, like America is or has been, I think we still are militarily, you needed a bunch of good horses. And the Egyptian horses were the best ones. The Egyptian horses were the sophisticated uh, instruments of war. Uh, chariots, of course, would be pulled by those horses sometimes, or you'd have your soldiers on horseback. They were the most beautiful horses. They were the fastest horses. And uh, Egypt did a good job of breeding them, had for many years. This is written in the days of Deuteronomy, before they came into the land even. Number two, verse 17, he must not acquire many wives for himself. So his heart won't go astray. Okay, so it's, it's almost like God could see this coming. He knew what the temptations would be to go back to Egypt and get the best horses because that, in everyone's eyes, would be the best military. And number two here, to acquire many wives because that was like how you 
demonstrated that you were like, uh, you know, the Donald Trump of his day, you know, you were the Bill Gates of his day, you know, you were the big cheese, you had all the wives, and of course there were treaties involved between different countries and many political advantages to having lots of wives from lots of countries trying to make peace, and then of course it just showed that you were the big cheese, right? Number three. He must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. So you're not to just become super rich. That's not the king's goal. The king's goal is to serve the people and to lead them well, not to acquire all kinds of wealth. And when he is seated in his royal throne, verse 18, he is to write a copy of this instruction. This is number four. He is to write a copy of this instruction for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests... It is to remain with him, and he is to read from it all the days of his life so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to observe all the words of this instruction, and to do these statutes. Three things there, if you're taking notes. He he will learn (laughs) to observe the words of this instruction. I'm sorry to fear the Lord, observe the words, and do the statutes. Then his heart will not be exalted above his countrymen. He goes on for them. He will not turn from this command to the right or the left, and he and his sons will continue reigning many years in Israel. All right, so what Solomon did. Let's go over to 1 Kings chapter 10. Begin in verse 16, verse 26, sorry. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 1,200 horsemen. 12,000, sorry, yeah, 12,000 horsemen, thank you. Don't appreciate that. So again, in Deuteronomy, it says he must not acquire many horses. How many is many, I guess, is the question Solomon may have asked himself. Is it is 12,000 many, or does it have to be 100,000 before it becomes many? Seems like it was many. And he stationed them in chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. There's another thing God said not to do, to just acquire wealth upon wealth. But he did it. And he made cedar as abundant as sycamore in the Judean foothills. That was the most valuable wood building material. Solomon's houses were, horses were imported from Egypt. And that's like exactly what God said not to do, right? You're not supposed to send back to Egypt for horses or send anybody back there to get them. Mm-mm. The king's traders brought them from Ku at the going price. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 15 pounds of silver and a horse for four pounds in the same way that... I want to have horses gone up or down, four pounds of silver, $25 an ounce, 12 ounces in a pound of silver. That's the way they figure that, right? Yeah, so that's uh, 25, three, that's $300 times, uh, sorry... (coughs) Four pounds, three hundred, twelve hundred dollars for a horse. Uh, something like that, yeah. Still cheaper than a Ford pickup. <laughs> I don't know, twelve hundred dollars for a horse. I don't know, maybe that's about the going right now, depending on what kind of horse you get. I don't know. There they were. Back on track. <sighs> Fifteen pounds of silver and a horse for four pounds. In the same way, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of Aram through their agents. So they had a going trade route, a business. There were not only the concerns of becoming a superpower, becoming prestigious in their military, but there was an economic incentive behind the accumulation of these things as well. Verse chapter 11. King Solomon loved many foreign women. 
That's a third thing God says over here he's not to do here. In addition to Pharaoh's daughter, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. There are a bunch of scriptures on that, actually, besides the one we read in Deuteronomy. And they must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines. And they turned his heart away. Let's just pause right there. So he must have been a very wise man, very sharp man, if he could remember the names of a thousand wives. <laughs> did he just number them or did he have, he knew their names probably, he was pretty smart. Oh yeah, what was your, what was your, okay. All right, so before we just start, you know, picking on Solomon, you get to realize that this is the person who wrote Song of Songs and wrote the book of Proverbs and wrote Ecclesiastes, or at least these are his writings that were gathered together, okay? So, you know, we're talking about a wise man. The Bible's clear through the whole Bible that he was, he was as wise as you get in obviously some ways, but here we find he was foolish in other ways. But imagine the pressure and expectation on him, and uh, imagine yourself in a place where you're the king and you're a young king. And uh, right away in his kingship, he exercises real faith in God. He honors his father, David, receives a blessing from him. He's seeking the Lord, and God gives him wisdom and favor. And right away at the beginning of his reign, his concern is to do a good job as king. That's what he means when he's asking God for wisdom. He wants to do a good job in his governmental role. If you like wanting to be the best governor you could be and then the best president of a country you could be, he knew he needed wisdom. He told God that. I am just a young man. I need wisdom. You remember reading that in here? And so right away as he's seeking this wisdom, as he's trying to find out how to be the best leader he can be, one of the things he does is he brings in an advisor from Egypt. And this may be how he got connected, part of marrying Pharaoh's daughter. Egypt was famous for their wisdom in governmental affairs. Egypt had a dynasty, and it was, there were times it was broken, and, but a continuing and reoccurring dynasty that had gone back probably longer than Solomon could find in history. Okay? And they had all their monuments, and they had all their traditions, and they had all their stability. And here Israel was just an upstart. Solomon's just the third king they'd ever had. And it's kind of chaos. It's all these tribes, all these, all these individual leaders of these little, little parts of tribes, and, and it, you know, a bunch of this chaos. And now the king under, under, uh, under, really under David for the first time, had, the kingdom had really come together under Saul and then under David and now Solomon. It's, it's a kingdom that's just going. He's got all these responsibilities. He knows it's on, he's, it's on him to build this temple to God. It's on him to now bring stability in the middle of chaos as a young man. And so he's seeking all the wisdom he can get. That's pretty noble, isn't it? If it was in our day, he would be listening to TED Talks. He'd be going to school. He'd be getting coaches, personal coaches executive coaches, business coaches, church coaches. He would be reading all the latest books. He would, he would, be, he would, be, he would be devouring them. He would be going to seminars. He would, this is the thing, these, this, what he did was his version in that day of these kinds of things. Self-improvement, right? Taking the biggest steps of growth we can possibly take. And so in the middle of this, he knows God, he knows God's word, he's pursuing God, and he's pursuing the practical wisdom to run his kingdom in every way he can. And that includes bringing in an advisor from Egypt, it includes taking advice from people, and he's trying to feel 
this out. Okay? The people around him who were successful in their government were probably saying something to him like, you need to make some political alliances by marrying some of these daughters of these other kings. It's a real good move for us as a little country to get in good with Egypt, you know, the major power to the south. Marry Pharaoh's daughter. Take good care of her. Show, that, show, the, show the Pharaoh that we've got our act together and that we can really, you know, be royal and we'll start trading with him. We'll be able to make money by selling to these other smaller nations. It's a, it's a plan for economic success. Make Israel great again. Well, sorry, 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 forget it. You can't apply it like that. It's a plan for economic success. The sophistication and the power of these Egyptian horses, and chariots, these armies becoming a superpower in his day. Everyone becomes excited. And just think about as this human wisdom that Solomon began to follow as a young man, just think about it as it starts to take off. All of a sudden, people coming in to, to, Ju, to Jerusalem, it's been a year, and they see all the progress on the temple or the palace, and they see the royal guard, and all of a sudden, you know, where there was just this scrub army, now there's like, you know, a couple thousand horse-mounted soldiers, you know, trotting through town, and whole cities being built to house the chariots, and all the people are saying, wow, this is it, we're growing. We're moving forward. We're really becoming something. And we're making money off this. We're making money. Everybody's growing in their wealth. They're taking the advice that they're taking and the path they're taking is, is, is causing everyone to say, don't stop this train. Keep it going. This is how you run a government. This is how you run a country the right way. Every year, we're growing. We're going we're gonna to start sending out ships, doing trade and making money. We're, gonna, we're making all these alliances. No one would dare come against, us, come against us now. We've got everything going for us because we're following this path of wisdom. Now, that is a lot of pressure to stand against. Imagine being a governmental official in our day. And there's a policy in government that has a lot of bling and looks good on media and makes a lot of money for a lot of people. How many politicians would stand up and say, I don't think we should do this for moral reasons? You can't even get people to say th that about things like uh, the lottery or gambling or something. You know, you know, a lot of people have addictions to that and their lives get ruined, and, but we make a little money, so it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's your choice. It's just like a tax, right? I mean, think of, that's just some little thing, the lottery in a state. Think about the entire economic success of what's happening and all the promotions that are happening and this machine that's taken off. Who would have the strength to stand against that and say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, God said we're not supposed to marry these women you know, make alliances this way. Wait a minute, God said we're not supposed to try to show off our power by going to Egypt and buying these horses and building these chariot cities. And wait a minute, God said we're not just supposed to keep on going as fast as we can to just make ourselves as rich as we can, that there's some kind of other priority that's supposed to be number one in our lives. How many of you know that's a tough spot to be? Say amen. amen. Think about your own life. What pressures are you under? Man, probably none of us are under pressures anywhere close to what someone like this would be under. But you know what? With the power of Jesus Christ, a Christian can do what's right. It doesn't say in here anything about this fourth thing we saw in Deuteronomy, about writing these instructions down himself, the king, and reading them every day. But I can tell you with near 100% certainty, though I was not there, that Solomon did not do that either. 
Because you can't sit there on your throne every morning reading the instructions of God and then turn around and just disregard them day after day. Nobody does it. We find a way to get those out of here. Well, that was that old thinking, that old Deuteronomy thinking. I don't need, you know, now, this is how. I was at SDSU. I did not get to eat at Chick-fil-A. It's the move-in day. It's kind of hard. Chick-fil-A is kind of not open that day. And, but I'll be back. I'll be back. And I won't miss Chick-fil-A when it's open and I'm there and I have a chance. The guy that founded Chick-fil-A, Truett Cathy was his name, and his son, Dan Cathy, now runs Chick-fil-A. And so what Chick-fil-A is famous for is having really good food, in my mind, but also they're famous for not being open on Sundays. You know that, right? Everybody kind of knows that if you know anything about Chick-fil-A. And so they did that from the beginning because they were Christians, just because Truett and his son, Dan, and the other people that run Chick-fil-A said, this is the Lord's day. God said to have a day of rest. And so it's not right for us to make people work when they should be having a day of rest and a day where they can, if they want to, go to church or whatever they want to do. So we are going to be closed on Sundays. And I wonder, when Chick-fil-A was taking off, it had another name, I think, when it started, like Dwarfs or something like that, the first one of them. Anyhow, as soon as they took off and started to have multiple stores, I wonder how many experts in, in fast food came in to help out Truett and Dan. I wonder how many of them came in and said, Truett, man, I just, you're such a good person. And Truett, I just, I really respect, this, you know, you and your, your moral stand is wonderful. People, people love it, that, you, that you're an upstanding person. But man, if you were just open on Sundays, you could really make this restaurant chain you see, people want to eat on Sundays. People, if you're closed on Sundays, people are going to like, they're going to go down the street looking for food, and they're going to want to pull into Chick-fil-A, and then they're going to realize, ah, oh, it's Sunday, which I've done many times <laughs> when I used to live in bigger places. It's Sunday. I can't eat a Chick-fil-A today. That's what people are going to say, and then they're going to go to your competition. And, I mean, on and on and on. And you, hey, true it, you're giving away a seventh of your revenue when you close on Sundays, a seventh of your revenue. This is a competitive business, Truett. You can't run a restaurant and be closed one day of the week, a fast food restaurant. You can't do that, Truett. That's not the way it's done. You're hurting your bottom line. You're not going to be able to be successful. Oh, it might work a little bit here in some southern state, like some buckle the Bible belt thing, but you want to expand? It's not going to work, Truett. You're not going to be able to do this, Truett. Dan, Kathy, true it's dead now. He died a few years ago. Dan is worth eight and a half billion dollars, personally. His son, Dan Truett. Eight and a half billion. He doesn't own the whole company. He is, the family kind of owns it. There's several owners in the family. Dan's portion, who's kind of the spokesperson and I don't know if he's, he's, he might be the CEO, but there's a different president. Anyway, it gets, gets complicated, I'm sure, when you get that big. His personal worth is $8.5 billion. Now, that's just the blessing of good chicken. I mean, the blessing of God, right there. <laughs> but I mean, we think about that. I mean, think about the pressure Truett was probably under, his dad, during those days, and Dan, too, later on, probably. Think about that pressure. That's the kind of pressure Solomon was under. Look at the blessing God's given them, the Kathy family, through this, and all of us through being able to eat Chick-fil-A. Think of the blessing that's been released because they said, no, this is what we think God has said to do. This is what we're going to do. See, now, this is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is knowing in your knower, in your deepest place, that God knows best that God's way is the best way, the smartest way. There is no smarter way. No matter how many people tell you differently, no matter how much our culture tells you one thing or another, you know, or, or you know, love is love or whatever it is. No, 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 no. God has this way, and God's way is the best way for a human being, for a family, for a country, for me. 
There is no better way. This is what Solomon did not do. He did not walk out his days as if God's way was the very best way. He allowed himself to be influenced by a different kind of wisdom, a wisdom that robbed him of God's best. I don't want to be robbed of God's best. Amen. I don't want to be robbed of God's very best for me, for my children, for my the heritage I leave behind when my days are done. I don't want to be robbed. I want the best. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's just finish up this little section. Verse 4. When Solomon was old, his wives, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. See, there's this... He's got the tension going on. He's saying, God, I see what you're doing, and I really respect that, and I really love you, but I'm going to do things this way. And over time, over time, over the years, the wisdom of God is proved true, either because I followed it with my life or because I didn't follow it with my life. Amen. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God, ah, as his father David had been. His heart was turned away through those years. Solomon followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Let's just pause there. What's going on there? Well, it started out, see, with these wives. You've got to bring the, you gotta make these alliances. This is the way we do it. But, but you know what else the kingdoms did in those days? If there was a powerful country that they wanted to show honor to or some people they were making alliances to, they would begin to honor the God of that country. See, it was just good politics. It was a good way to run a nation. And Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. At the time, Solomon built a high place at Chemoth, the abhorrent idol of Moab, and for Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites, on the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their gods. It was a regular United Nations love fest going on. And God said, that's not my plan for blessing." Or my people. That is not my plan. The Lord was angry with Solomon, verse 9, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods. But Solomon did not do what the Lord had commanded. Then the Lord said to Solomon, since you have done this and did not keep my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. He goes on from there. Even in that, he, he shows mercy. But I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. And this is exactly what God said he would do back in Deuteronomy. He said he'd do the same thing. He said, if you will follow me in this, you and your children will continue to reign for many years. And if you don't, that means they won't. So this is what Solomon did. Now, what Solomon got. You've got a handout that's Solomon's story. I thought it would be good to just look at this one more time as we finish this series. And the first page of it, it says Solomon's story. That's the first side to look at. It's blue. Yours is blue. Um, the first part... Just to skim through is, of course, he's born, and David helps establish him as king. And coming in there, there are some political enemies that he deals with, with wisdom, some according to his father's advice and some according to his own, you know, wisdom. Looking at the second column, with the reign of Solomon there beginning, we have um, him coming in, and remember, we had a message on this, the primary mode of dealing with these people that were causing trouble was he gave them 
the opportunity to make their own decision of where they wanted to be. Were they going to be faithful and good, or were they going to be a problem and stand against, uh, against his kingdom, against the country? And so he gave them each the opportunity to make their own decision, to kind of set their own destiny. This is a great leadership principle. Going on through there, Joab finally dies. We come down toward the bottom. It says, Pharaoh gives Gezer to Solomon. That's 1 Kings 9, 16 through 17. That's when his advisors begin to come in from Egypt. He's made an alliance with Egypt, 1 Kings 3, 1. He's seeking wisdom, and then God appears to him, the last entry there at Gibeon. And so Solomon begins to function under two kinds of wisdom at the same time, attempting God's and God's gifts he's given him, and then a wisdom which isn't from God. All right, next page. You can see he goes through, he begins to build uh, his kingdom. He builds the temple first off, which is wonderful, and it's dedicated to the Lord. And then... um, Over on the right, the last column, we see Solomon. He's building up his kingdom, fortifying his cities. Then he builds a house for Pharaoh's daughter. He builds a shipping fleet. The queen of Sheba comes to visit him. His fame has spread far and wide. And so, just taking a pause right there, that's like halfway down the last column on the right. If you were to Come visit Solomon at this moment. Let's say Queen Sheba had, the Queen of Sheba had just left him. If you were to go visit King Solomon and you said to him, Solomon, I think you're doing this all wrong. I think you're building this kingdom all wrong. I bet Solomon would have sat back and looked around. He would have said, well, there's the temple I built for the Lord. It's pretty grand and amazing. Here's the palace that I built. It's just It's as amazing as it gets. And uh, here are the cities that I fortified. And here's this fleet of ships that I've got now. You know, they're bringing everything from around the world to my kingdom, apes and ivory and gold and all kinds of other things. I think things are doing pretty well. Who are you to say to me that my life is on on the right track? Look at the success that's all around me. You know Solomon would have said that, right? That is what Solomon would have said. But what was happening in his life? From God's perspective, when you looked at his whole life, what was going on? Things were about to take a turn for him because he was continuing to build his kingdom and his life on a wisdom that was not from God. And so the career that he was building and the wealth that he was acquiring, all of it was about to to become nothing at the end of his life because, of the, because he was building on sand instead of on the rock of God's commands and what he instructed. So right after this, after she, the queen of Sheba leaves, we see him giving in to the women and idolatry, and he's marrying a lot of wives. And then the last part here, we see God raising up adversaries to stand against Solomon. Now look at this. This isn't just, this isn't Satan coming in and attacking. This is God raising up adversaries to fight against Solomon because Solomon was not leading God's way. Jeroboam is one of these and he ends up getting run off to Egypt, but he's going to come back and take all the tribes except for Uh, Judah and Benjamin away from Solomon's son. Wow. And then Solomon dies. So I wonder if Solomon were to rise from the dead 10 years after he died and the kingdom was turned over to his son and got all split up and there's war everywhere and now things aren't going well with Egypt. I wonder if he were to rise from the dead and look around him what he would think about his own life and the way he decided to build. I think he would look at his own wisdom and say, wow, I became a fool. <laughs> I became a fool. I was, I was going, I was just, it was, I was trying to make the money. I was trying to please these people. I was trying to 
build, because this is what a whole group of advisors said was the best way to build, and it was working. It seemed to be working. It was working. We were becoming famous. But anything I try to build in my life, which stands against what God has clearly said, is going to come to nothing. Amen. So if God has said, <clears throat> don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of, this is a problem happening in the New Testament, right after, you know, right after the church is being born. No, but I want you guys, to, I want you to continue to meet with the fellowship and be encouraged with by one another, sing songs together and hymns together and, and, and study the word of God together and build each other up and pray for the sick. If that's what God said to do, then I am going to be committed to a fellowship of believers, I'm going to be committed. I'm going to teach my children to be committed to God's church. Amen? Amen. I'm going to teach them that this is a priority in our lives, that this is important. For my kids, there are sports that we haven't done on purpose because they just, it was, it's just impossible to do them and not be gone on Sundays all the time. And that was the day our church worships. God is more important than those things. You can do a different sport or we'll do something else. It's a reasonable decision to make for me in my mind as a parent to instill to them, in them, that this is the most important thing. And there were times where, you know, <clears throat> that hurt a little bit for different ones of the kids that were like, I really wanted to do this or that. And I'm like, it's just not working out. Look, it's just going to be really tough. You're going to miss all these times we're not going to go do this instead of worship it's not going to happen so you know that was a little bit of a price to pay but compared to the blessing of following god of knowing god it's nothing what would have happened in solomon's life if he'd said wow god we need you desperately we want to be a great country but by golly we are not going to go to egypt and buy horses there we're going to do something else. We've got our own horses. We better start breeding them. Whatever it is, you know, they look like uh, Shetland ponies. Oh, I guess we're trusting in God. You know, whatever it is. What if he had said that? Would God have abandoned him? Would, would, would somehow he, you know, of course not. The blessing of God would have been able to remain on his life in a greater way. Or if he had said, look, I'm not going to marry all these women. You know, I'm just a king. I, I want to keep it simple. I'm just going to have a hundred wives, not a thousand wives. And... <laughs> To keep it simple here, then what would God have done? Would, 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 he have, would all of his alliances have fallen apart and everybody have destroyed the country? Of course not. God would be fighting for him. It would be the best future possible for him and for his country and for his children and for those to come. It would be the best future possible. It, would, it is the smartest thing to do if you really believe there's a God and you believe what he said. Amen. It's the same with my life. Everything that God has asked me to do, you know, my my time, my, the things I'm taking in through my eyes and ears, the things I'm saying, what I'm doing with my money, you know, how I'm leading my family, all these things. Every time God gives me some instruction, it is not to kill my joy. It is so that I can understand this is the path of blessing. This is how you walk and actually find joy and blessing in the Lord. I don't want to get what Solomon got. Amen. So this is what Solomon said. Psalm 127. This is our, really our last scripture. Psalm 127. Solomon's psalm. This is what he said. Unless the Lord builds a house... Its builders labor over it in vain. Wow. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain, you get up early and you stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yet he gives sleep. To the ones he loves. That's the joy of knowing I'm doing right before God. My, hand, my life is in the hands of the Lord. He is the one taking care of me, providing for me. Loving me. Leading me. 
second half of this psalm is all about children and how happy they'll be, you know, an inheritance, a continuing on of God's blessing. Poor Solomon. The richest man ever was. Poor Solomon. That all of that stole from him the blessing that could have been his, should have been his. Smart, smartest guy, talented, gifts from God, a blessing, regardless of the mistakes he made, a great blessing. We have these books written. But man, an ending like that, an ending that misses this, unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor in vain. Just bow your head with me if you would right now. God, I just, I thank you, Lord. God, I'm just, I just want to say thanks again that you don't um, hold back when it comes to just revealing the truth of the people we read about in the Bible, God. There's just, you're not, God, the evidence is clear. You're not making up stories and these aren't fabled heroes who do everything right all the time. God, your, your word is true. You're showing who they really were. And you said yourself, Lord, in your word, that you've given us these things for our benefit, for our benefit, that we would know, that we would be able to walk in a way that's pleasing to you. You've shown us the good and the way you worked to bless. And God, their mistakes. And God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping us, having mercy on us. God, when it comes to the households that we lead, our own lives, God, our own singleness, or our own married life, God, there's a way you want us to be at every time. There's a path you've said. This is the path of blessing. Blessing. God, it is the very best. God, I don't want to sabotage my life. God, it is the very best. We believe you. This is faith in you, God. That what you've said is true. Even if it seems to cost a little something, or even if it doesn't seem to go with some wisdom that we're hearing around us, God, you are true. Your words are true. The life that you've given us is the greatest life of blessing possible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, if you're in this place, and you know there are parts of your life that have not been honoring God, things that you know are true in his word, ways of, of, of living and speaking and doing, and, and you're, just, you're not doing what he said, this is the time. Just tell him, just repent before him. Say, hey, God, I'm sorry, I'm changing directions. God, I, I don't want to play the part of the fool. That a little time goes by or when my days are done, I look back and say, I was an idiot to do that. God, I don't want to play that fool. God, I want to be wise. I want to put my faith in you and live it out to walk out your instruction. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for this area. And just tell him right now. Tell him, ask him to forgive you. And tell him how much you love him. And commit to do it his way. In our words, our thoughts, our deeds. To do it his way. Thank you, Jesus Christ. We ask you for the strength to do that. Holy Spirit, we need your help. We can forget by evening time today what we made a commitment for right now. God, help us. God, we're depending on your help. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And God, we repent of things that are dark and even of wisdom that seems good, gets a lot of praise, maybe gets some thumbs up when we post it online. But God, it does not match what you have said. God, we don't want it. That is not the direction we're going. We belong to you. It's our privilege, God, to be able to say yes to your leadership. Thank you, Lord. If you're in this place and you don't know the Lord, just turn your life over to him. This is what it means. It doesn't mean we know everything instantly, but it means we begin to follow him as one of his disciples, saying, Jesus I want to follow you. I want to know you and what you've said. That's what I want to do with all my heart. Help me, God. Save me, God. I can't live just directing my own life. I'm giving my life to you. 
That is what it means to come to the Lord. If that's you, just ask him. Just ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to lead you and commit your life to him. And God, just send your Holy Spirit fill the overflowing each person who is coming to you right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name I pray.